What's up guys, I'm Just a Gamer and I'm back with another reaction video. Hell is Us has released an extended gameplay video. Now this is a game we saw revealed at the last Sony State of Play. And while we were watching it, I thought it looked really interesting. Like the whole, the monster designs were really top notch in my opinion. It looked really creepy and cool. But there was something about the gameplay that just felt a little stiff. It just didn't look like it was quite there. But regardless, the monster designs themselves really piqued my interest. So I'm really excited to see what they're gonna show here. And who knows, maybe this extended gameplay look will bring the combat and the gameplay well bring the combat and the gameplay into a new light for me. So yeah, enough of me talking. Let's get into it. Hi everyone, my name is Jonathan Jacques Villatet. I'm the creative director and the art director on Hell is Us. I hope you enjoyed uh, the trailer that you've seen recently. Uh, today we're back in the spotlight. We're gonna show you a bit of gameplay, a bit more than what you've seen in the trailer, and I hope that you will enjoy this part greatly. All right, so let's start with the basics. So Hell is Us is set to be released in 2025. It's for pretty much everything. So Xbox Series X, PlayStation 5, and uh, PC. So the game is a bit uh, of a take back to games from the 1990s. We're a team of passionate people. The average on the team is like 20 years of uh, development experience. So we're from a different generations and we have a lot of love for how the games in the 90s were made and how they were uh, played and experienced, especially the fact that uh, you know there was no hand holding, there was no silver plattering. You kind of had to figure stuff out by yourself. You were really in control of your exploration and your own discoveries. And this is what we're trying to do uh, in Hell Is Us, obviously with modern flair okay, and okay. kind of like modern uh, knowledge of, of game design. So basically this is for the people who've been complaining recently a lot that like there's too much hand holding in games, like quest markers pointing everything out, too many like yellow, you know, yellow ledges that show they're climbable. This is the game for the people who were like, that's just too easy, make it harder. So this is basically for them and whatnot, but very much puts you back in the driver's seat of your experience and of your exploration and then the result and the joy of your discoveries. So Hell is Us takes place in a country called Hadea. Hadea is in the grips of a uh, vicious civil war. You play the role of Remy. Remy is actually from Hadea. He was born there, but his mom smuggled him out at the age of five, like it sometimes happens in those countries. Uh, and what I mean by that is Hadea is a hermit state, it's a turtle state, it's completely closed off on itself. Nobody goes out, nobody comes in. And that's why Remy's mom decided to smuggle him out so he can have a better life. He grew up in the foster home system or the foster system in Canada. He's always wanted to come back to Hadia. He wants to find his parents again. He wants to kind of like confront them. He's got a lot of questions for them. He understands why they abandon him, but yet, you know, uh, abandonment is pretty much the biggest trauma that a child can have. And there's like a loop that hasn't been closed properly for him towards this situation and his parents. When the game starts, Remy uh, has finally been able to infiltrate Hadia during the brutal uh, civil war that I was talking about. Remy is a ON peacekeeper. Uh, he quit his post, uh, he went AWOL, infiltrated the country, and this is where the game starts. Remy remembers two things, and that means the players remember two things. It's that uh, his village of birth Manual was called save. Jova, and his father was the blacksmith of Jova. Those are the only clues you begin the game with, and these are the only clues that Remy also know. So equipped with this knowledge, with these clues, you begin the game and you try to find your way to Jova. You must be lost to wander around Sinedra Forest. I'm afraid I have very little to offer. A group of strange-looking soldiers arrived here last night in an APC. And perhaps you can ask them for help. It's not the first time I've seen them. They always seem to be snooping around here for something. Okay, so I'm, I'm blocking a little bit, but there's... It says investigation, and it says the person's name, which is Ernest Cadwell, and then Village of Vidova. So I just wanted to get that little tidbit there that, that I am blocking a little bit of something. They parked their APC just beyond the woods, to the north. Once in the woods, follow the wind chimes. They will lead the way through. The gate to enter the woods is locked. Here, take this key to unlock it. Wow, okay, very so old school this uh, design philosophy vibes. That I mentioned earlier, which is, uh, you know, I said the word silver plattering is something that I had been thinking about for, for quite a few years and uh, the team as well, which is if you look at modern day or contemporary adventure games and RPGs, uh, pretty much everything is given to you on a silver platter. When I 
But yeah, when the key the key item came up and it was just like on the screen and the little the little sound dong, that reminds me so hardcore of like old school games like you know Resident Evil, Silent Hill. It's just wow, very old school. Very you can clearly tell where these guys grew, <laughs> what games these guys grew up with. I mean by that is when you explore, everything appears in front of you. You know, you have your compass on top of you. That's like a sixth sense, like a magical sense that detects, you know, all the, the caves and all the, the cool stuff around you and the towers and this and whatnot. Uh, it just appears magically. And you have your map and you have your mini map and you have your quest markers and you have your objective markers and you can drop your own markers and, and you have your quest journals and it just never ends. And if you think about it, uh, what happens with that is that you're not truly, truly exploring. You're just kind of like flying by wire. And when you find something, it's not really your discovery. It was kind of handed to you on a silver platter. So what you're looking at now is we're having a discussion with a bloke named Ernest Cadell. He's telling us certain information. And then he tells us it's quite far. Uh, you need to itch a ride. Uh, you might find people that are willing to give you a ride. Uh, it's up to the north of my house, so you're gonna have to use your compass, but your real compass, right, with the coordinates on it, north, south, east, west, blah, 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 and follow that. And he tells you that in the Lost Woods, in order to find your way out, just follow the wind chimes. He says, I've attached them there for my kids when they were young, because they kept them getting lost in those bloody woods. And then he tells you, follow the sound of the wind chimes, and you'll find your way on the other side of the woods. That's how we do it. It's very organic. It's very realistic. You know, someone in real life could have told you the exact same thing. So the environments, the visuals of the game are not just there to illustrate, they're there to communicate. So you need to play the game. You need to open your eyes. You need to open your ears to what NPCs tell you. You're going for the hard, life, hardcore. You'll discover things and you will truly own your discoveries and the great joy that comes with that. Yeah, they want to make it like, again, this is for all the people complaining that games are too easy, they hold your hand too much. So here's another scene or another section that could be considered part of our uh, player plattering philosophy. So here's a puzzle and there's obviously a solution to the puzzle, but nothing eventually is going to tell you, you know, if the player ends up kind of like uh, taking a bit of time to find a solution. There's not going to be any artificial kind of ways that are going to help him or tell him what to do. Remy's not going to start talking to himself or i.e. talking to the player with, you know, little clues and whatever. It's really up to you to figure them out. And in the way that the player plattering is inserted in this, we have a good example here uh, with your trusty drone uh, named Cappy. By the way, you can tell now that Remy has his poncho and he has his sword and he has his drone. So it's after he's acquired them, right? Because at the beginning of the game, you saw he was not dressed like that. Now there's a reason why he ends up dressed like this. There's a reason why he needs these things, this equipment, but we don't need to get into these details today. So anyway, there's an ancient language. In I mean, I would love country, to know those details. Uh, and you kind of find it throughout the game. And the drone has a software, one of his many softwares, and this specific one can translate the ancient language. So this puzzle, the way that it works, you need to kind of like um, explore and observe your environment around this specific puzzle in order to find the clues on how to solve it. You need the drone, your trusty Cappy, his name is Cappy, also there's something behind that, of course, and you translate those old texts. It gives you little passages of a poem or a psalm or something like that, and through what they tell you and the order in which they seem to have to be pieced back together, you find your clues on what this puzzle does and how to solve it. So again, the players are kind of like just led to their own devices, but things are there, the answers are there, and you have to explore, and again, I repeat it, you have to open your eyes and open your ears, and you'll figure it out. So by Alrighty. now, uh, you've seen a lot of what I guess is like exploration and looking around and talking to people and doing puzzles and all that kind of sweet stuff. But if you've seen the trailer, you of course notice that there's another big aspect to the game, which is third person melee combat. So we like to say that the game is 50% exploration and 50% combat. The game is not at all only about combat and it's definitely not at all just walking around and figuring stuff out. It's the combination of both. And we also think that the way that we've combined them is quite refreshing and quite unique in Hell Is Us. So, like I said, combat is an integral part of the game. I do want to emphasize now that we're not a uh, Souls-like game. The game is a lot more mid-core. It's have fun, get in it, and uh, hack and slash. It doesn't mean it's easy. Thank you. Thank you for telling that, uh, t saying that off the bat. 
because so when people see action games, they automatically start trying to say, oh, is it like Dark Souls or a Souls like or blah blah blah? And it's like, no, it's just an action game. And so thank you for saying that right off the bat. Dear Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I like what he says. Like it's you know mid core is like fun action, fast paced, nice. I like it. Also, again, enemy designs, so cool, so creepy. Easy. It's not overly hard. There's a learning curve. There's subtleties. There's little things that we've invented just for the the flair and the flavor of Hell Is Us. It's very crunchy. I think the friction is pretty good, and uh, I hope you'll enjoy it. So there's a wide variety of Ooh, enemies in the game. Different so weapons. So we have kind of like the more common enemy type, which we call the Hollow Walker. So it's these kind of humanoid, bipedal, white enemies that you can uh -oh. see here with the holes in their faces and their chests and whatnot. So obviously there's a reason why they're called Hollow Walkers and there's different types of them and different kind of tiers of strength and powers. But when you're facing pretty much the biggest threats in the game, it's what we call like a dual entity. So it's like a Hollow Walker has a haze inside of it. So it's when the haze is present. I'm not gonna get into the details right away of what the haze represents. It's all part of the lore and what you will figure out in the game. But when you're facing a combo like these dual entities, and it can go to like three of them, four of them, there's the herders, there's the fervents and different types like that. But that's when you really need to master the combat system. That's when you start having to use all the tools and techniques at your disposal. The drone has tons of skills to upgrade it, and the drone is very much your little sidekick to help you in fighting multiple enemies at a time. He's not a sidekick in the sense where he talks and he has an AI. He's very much a drone that has its own protocol to do this crowd management during the combat. So you have your different weapons, you have your limbic skills attacked to weapons, which is basically you can see it as your magic, even though in the game it's not considered magic, it's kind of like a scientific base to them. But that's when you really need to master all the little subtleties of the combat system, use all the tools in your arsenal and at your disposition, and get in the melee with these kind of dual or triple or quadruple entities and being able to manage them and uh, be victorious. So, like I mentioned, here specifically, you can see a combat Looks against a little Olympic Entity stiff. that has multiple hazes attached to the Hollow Walker. That's when it gets really complex, it gets very overwhelming because you're alone, but you got your trusty little cat. So, you need to use its skill. So, for example, Cappy has a skill where you can distract an entity, either a haze or a hollow walker. Uh, you can use the forward charge, which is one of my favorite. You also have the typhoon. You have the super dash Ooh. skill, which is another dual one of my favorites. Dual axis. Start dashing sideways, forward, backwards, really, really fast. It gives you like this Japanese action game style. And then you also have your Olympic skill, so you need to find the glyphs in the game and you need to attach them to your weapons. And this is when you start getting powers that come from these weapons that allow you to take your of these enemies in much more powerful and kind of like impressive ways that's when the vfx and the sound effects all come together and give you this combat bang that we all like and love okay so now let's take a little pause from the combat and let's go back to the investigation so yeah combat wise again just like in the uh state of play it looks a bit stiff it looks like, you know, there's like a stiffness to it. The animations aren't completely there. But again, this is alpha footage. Maybe they'll iron all that out. Maybe they'll smooth things out. But for now, the the combat does look a little stiff. Not bad, but a little stiff. Investigation and the exploration. So, like I said, there's no silver plattering. There's none of these kind of like fly-by-wire. It's up to you to figure out what your kicker is. What I mean by kicker is what you're supposed to achieve at this specific moment, what you're actually looking for, where to look for it, and how to look for it, right? Remy and the players are at a ratio of information, which is one-one. It's in Akasa Marshes. It's quite a ways from here. So one of the tools that we're providing you to still kind of help you a bit and manage this one one kind of like knowledge ratio is your data pad. Think of it as a bit your investigation wall, if you want, but in a digital 90s format. So your clues, your leads, the important people that are related to your investigation, trying to find your parents and a lot more eventually are all stored here. They're linked together by the relationships. And now it's up to you to go and investigate about them. So as you can see here, some of the areas can be quite wide opened. This one here called the Casa Marshes is one of the bigger ones. And as I spoke quite a bit already, the game doesn't hold your hand or doesn't really tell you where to go. So out of your main leads or clues or ideas that you have in your head of what you're supposed to do or where you're supposed to go at any given moment, you will also be attracted by a lot of points of interest 
or just little things in the environment that pique your curiosity. And as you walk towards them, oh, explore, that's a cool ass that's weapon. You'll start also making a ton of like peripheral or side discoveries on your own, things that you cannot solve right away, or things that you might think that there is a thing to be done with it when there's none. And it's all part of the fun stuff and the kind of like experience that we're providing in the game. So as you can see here, there's a tree with people that have been hung. Uh, like I said, this takes place during a very vicious civil war between two different ethnicities in the countries that are still basically the exact same people. Yeah, and you found dark. a street. It's actually not part of the Golden Path or not part of something tremendously important in the game, but there's still something around it. There's still something to be found, and it's probably linked to more stuff that you can do in relation to it. But that, you had to do your own exploration to find it, and even more of your own exploration and investigation to figure out what it's linked to and what you can do from it, if you want. Okay. So here we are in a dungeon. In game? The game. So art, yes, art direction wise? Dungeons. This was really nice. important I, to us, like I said at the beginning. I like the visuals. A, bit of a love letter to games from the 90s. But one of the challenges was the game takes place in a contemporary setting. The game takes place in 1993. And yet we still wanted dungeons in the game and I didn't want the dungeons to take place in an abandoned metro station or you know in an abandoned factory because it's the modern era I still wanted the dungeons to be very ancient things and this brings us to another really important aspect of the game or one of the very important themes of the game which is history historicity deep history so history that goes even before history so there's a lot of mysteries and a lot of lore and the origin of what's going on in the country and the link to the civil war is all tied to that deep history and also what has happened since. I won't get into too much details because that will be part of another video for you guys, but you can see a bit of it here and it shows you the varied palettes and moods and atmospheres that we have in the game, which also I think is something quite interesting and unique that we're doing in Hell Is Us. Yeah, I think that's like the biggest strength of this so far for me is like the visuals. Visually, yes, it's not graphically like outstanding, but like the art direction Thanks wise, it's Thanks for really being with good. Us. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm extremely grateful to have you guys following us, the team as well. So just to repeat, the game Hell Is Us will be released in 2025 as box series, PlayStation 5 and PC. And there's a lot more coming soon about the game. This is just the beginning. We'll explain other aspects of it and get into sometimes a bit of the minutia. So stay tuned and speak to you soon. Thank you. Cool. All right. All right. All right. So that was an extended look at Hell Is Us. And yeah, the game looks really interesting. Again, like I've said it many times during the video, but yeah, they, this is a like very much for the people or the gamers who have been complaining that, you know, games have been too easy lately. They've been holding your hand too much. This is clearly for them because like it, they literally going out of their way to say themselves that there's going to be exploration and you want to explore something you just got to go explore it there's going to be no thing like no quest markers nothing like they are they are literally setting that up right off the bat which i appreciate same thing with the combat again i'm really happy that they off the bat just stated no this is not a souls like it is like you know action game and they say it's like it's not going to be too hard it's not going to be too easy it's we're trying to find a like nice middle section of it again i'm liking everything they're saying when it comes to combat, like I said before, it looks a bit stiff. There's, you know, some things here and there that I'm a little like, oh, looks a little rough. But overall, combat looks fine. But yeah, I think the biggest strength of this game, like I just said earlier, was I think the art direction is really fantastic. Uh, yes, the game is not visually, graphically, you know, um, you know, realistic, high definition. You know, it's it's all it's uh it's all right i like the art style i like the direction they're going in and it looks really good honestly for like what it is i i think it looks really good and again the enemy design and that dungeon at the end looks super super awesome so this is a game i'm really gonna keep my eye on because yeah it really piqued my interest and i can only hope that you know as a more of it comes out and as it goes further in development it just gets better and better but yeah, those are my thoughts. That's my reaction. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like or comment down below. I appreciate any and all feedback. Subscribe. I'm streaming on Twitch, so please consider following me there at twitch.tv slash justdigamerink. All together than word. Or you can click the link below. But what are your guys' thoughts on Hell Is Us? I mean, are you like me that you think it's interesting and you're wanting to know more? Or is this just not for you? You're not a fan of the way it looks or anything like that? Let me know in the comments. But regardless, thank you for watching. And until next time, take care and have a good game.